All right, and welcome to the Inward Investing Podcast. I'm Mike Ritter. Uh, Todd Whalen, my co-host, couldn't make it today, but I have an uh, excellent guest on the show, somebody that I've wanted on for quite a bit of time. And uh, I got to be honest with you, between me and Todd, the level of testosterone on this podcast has gotten way too high. And so I wanted to bring on my good friend, Jess Mather, uh, to bring a little estrogen into the show. So <laughs> Jess, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to go ahead, for people that don't know you, um, let's talk a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and give us a little background on, on you. Uh, who am I? So I'm a maniac. Uh, I'm from Maine, so that's what they call us. I'm oh, born really? in Maine. Yeah, that's we're cool. maniacs up there. Um, but I moved to Florida a while ago, uh, and you know, we're, we're only about two hours away from each other. I'm in Orlando. I've been here for, I think, like five years now. Um, and you went, I've been, you went from maniac to Floridian. Floridian. Yeah. And I was a Coloradian for a couple years. That was a great experience as well. Um, but now I'm back here. And uh, I've been uh, into the movement world for a really long time. I started when I was 15. And of course, as most women, I started because uh, I didn't like my body. right? And I was like, I got to do something. When I really should have just stopped eating McDonald's. But instead, I was like, I got to do all the exercise tapes. And I was doing like, the VHS <laughs> tapes from the 80s. Uh, buns of steel and abs of steel um, and it just sort of snowballed from there I found a sense of grounding and peace through my movement um, it was an escape a lot of times and it became kind of a therapy even as young as 15 or 16 um, and it just it just developed into something I wanted to do I ended up going into physical therapy so I got licensed as a PTA uh, and that was great, but it was also really depressing working with so many sick people. I just posted something about that today. Um, we don't realize how privileged we are to have the movement that we do and to be able to stand and walk and do all these things. And it was like, wow, I want to help more people facilitate that without feeling so depressed in these facilities. Um, so yeah, I've been working on my own business for a long time now <laughs> facilitating physical freedom and other people um, it's enormously important to me yeah that's that's pretty awesome and I as a physical therapist I have to imagine that your maybe perspective on reality gets a little skewed because when you see so many broken people does it feel like after a while that everyone's broken yes <laughs> because it you don't realize like how many people are really suffering. Um, I actually wanted to do a series, so this is, might keep me accountable. I haven't really publicly announced this too much, so your okay. podcast listeners are getting this. But we're hearing a I, world premiere. World premiere. I wanted to create a series called "To Be in This Body," and I wanted to do a series of um, almost like interviewing people about what their experiences is existing, just like existing in this like physical flesh, because we can see somebody and say they look pretty healthy, or they look skinny, or you know, they, they look strong, when really that person could be suffering from a really bad autoimmune condition, or like yeah. chronic back pain that can be debilitating, and we just don't know. And I, I really wanted to kind of express that and give people a platform to share, like this is really my experience in my body. It's more than just looks, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I, uh, one of my favorite memes, this gets passed around Facebook every now and again, What it, it's just words, and it just says, uh, you know, I may look like everything is okay, but deep inside my boot, my sock is sliding off. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> and, exactly it. Yeah, and, you know, as an FDN, I get a view into people metabolically, and so you have some people that are, you know, good looking, great energy, dress nice, and they have like just dire constipation. And no one knows it. And, you know, I get to meet people. And of course, you know, like I get to hear the stuff that, you know, no one else gets to hear. And so like metabolically, what people are walking around with on a regular basis that you don't know, um, or, you know, joint pain wise or movement deficiency wise, uh, some of it's very obvious and then some of it isn't. And, um, you know, I, I, I think when you get to work with people at a deep level like that, it does change your perspective on humanity in general. And so we actually met, um, to jump back just a little bit to, to the, the beginnings, we actually met, quote unquote, when I was writing for robwolf.com at the time. 
And I remember I wrote this massive piece on stress and stress adaption. And it basically, for me, that started as just a research project. And I got to be very fascinated with, fascinated, I guess, is the right word, with the clientele that I had at the time, plus myself, constantly seemed to be burned out. Mm-hmm. You know, when people get obese or have this quote, this metabolic syndrome problem where people get overweight, tired, run down, this whole adulting uh, culture, the culture of adulting is basically metabolic syndrome and adrenal fatigue. And so Mm -hmm. I was wondering why in the world are people, so many people having this exact problem. So the, the, the research kind of took me down a rabbit hole and before you know it, I'm 60 pages deep and I don't know what to do with it. And I ended up reaching out to Rob and started writing for a site and you actually reached out I think via comment or email. Um, and I guess it was kind of what you needed to read at that time in your life that I guess you were going through something similar. So let's talk a little bit about that time in your professional and personal career when you were, you know, experiencing some sort of burnout. What was that like? And describe it. My ass got kicked. <laughs> My ass got kicked by it. Yeah. Um, if your readers are people with metabolic damage, like, yeah, like they know it sucks. And it's um, embarrassing to have that happen to you as a professional, right? Of like somebody who who teaches people how to take care of themselves and then you're experiencing it yourself. Um, yeah. And, and what it came from was primarily I was pushing myself too hard in my training and I wasn't eating enough and I was following all the trendy trends of intermittent fasting and uh, strict paleo and low carb and high intensity interval training and heavy lifting and like on top of a stressful academic program on top of like a financially strained environment I was a college kid you know what I mean like there was a lot compounded um and I don't think we, we appreciate that training is a stressor. <laughs> like intermittent yeah. fasting is a stressor in the wrong environments. It can be used stress, right, or distress. Um, yeah. For me, it was distress. And I just kept pushing through because I think there's this culture, especially in the fitness industry, um, in the fitness culture of like you have to you have to just push through. Like you have to uh, go balls to the walls, so to speak. Yeah, um, sleep when you die. Yeah, sleep when you die. It's like uh, – it, it was terrible. It was terrible. And I, and I burned out hard. And at that point I had, it was 2013 where it really hit me. Um, now, were you a physical therapist at this time? I was, so, so I'm a PTA. So I was a PTA. I got licensed in 2012. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I started working as a therapist early 2013, I think. Um, and that was 2013 was when it hit me really hard. Um, and then I was having a relapse in 2015 when I read your article when I first moved back to Florida. Um, so I was really frustrated. Yeah. Like, I already been through this shit. Like, yeah. <laughs> why am I here again? Um, and your article, like, really spoke to me. Like, because at the time, there wasn't too, too much out there for, like, the layman's person, unless you really wanted to dive deep into the research. Yeah. Um, there weren't more, there weren't these, like, mainstream articles on it. And, um yeah, I remember being really affected by that, just reading your writing and, and feeling like I understood what was going on. It was just like, honestly, I was in tears. I was like, oh my God, this is me. This is like what I'm going through now. I have more knowledge of this. And I felt empowered um, to really help myself and then turn it around too and think like, I need to help these people. You know, like you also empowered me in that article to start focusing more on people who had burnout or stress or people who just felt broken and shitty, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's something that I felt at the time also was not put into layman's terms very much. Like a lot of the information I was reading was from Dr. Robert Sapolsky, who's an evolutionary biologist. So, I mean, you already had to have a decent amount of vocabulary down to understand his book. Um, but that, that book was called why zebras don't get ulcers. Oh yeah. And you know, it's, it's, it's something that's so common and you touched on something that I want to expand a little more on that this burnout idea, it's largely a lifestyle related, you know, for the Mm -hmm. most part, Mm self-induced, you know, there, there's two different components to the stress thing. There's stress and there's stressors. You can't do anything about stressors, you know, Mm -hmm. things like, you know, family member passing away, or if you have to move for your job, breakups, things like that, 
but how you respond to it is totally within your control. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, this can happen from a number of different ways. Like people can be subcaloric for a long period of time. Super mm -hmm. low calorie dieting, like you just mentioned. As a matter of fact, let's just go back over the checklist <laughs> that you were living at that time. Um, sounds a lot like the checklist that a lot of even fitness professionals mm -hmm. experience. And just because you're a fitness professional doesn't mean you have this like immunity cloak. And, yeah. you know, like a lot of this, to be perfectly candid, a lot of this article and the research that started my journey was everyone that I was working with seemed to have this problem. And then I was also experiencing that at that yeah. time, or just at least crawling out of it because, you know, like I became a fitness professional in 2008. Um, and 2012, I had, we had our first kid. Mm -hmm. And I did not respect the amount of change that that created in my life. So I understand, you know, like being in a position that you were in and dealing with all of these things happening to you, but you, you have good intentions the whole time. And how many mm -hmm. listeners out there are listening to this saying like that, this is totally me. And it's not like you don't care. You're not the person that's going through the drive through every single day right. and, you know, s snubbing your nose at the idea of exercise. You're actually trying. You're actually trying really freaking hard too. Really hard. <laughs> You just drove yourself into the into the dirt. So, what were some things that you did to help climb out of it yourself? So, I mean, you just listed like ten things. You can't just change everything at once. Ooh. What did you do? Ooh, um, that's a that's a big question. So, one was I I, I got help. Like I hired a professional. Um, it was a referral actually from a patient when I was working in ortho in Denver, and it was an osteopathic clinic. I didn't know anything about osteopathic work at the time. And this woman happened to be a nurse practitioner, but she knew what she was doing. Um, and she tested all my things. And, she, you know, she tried to put me on um, different, what do they call adaptogens? Yep. Right? So she, I got on different supplementation support, and it just wasn't working. Um, I had so much baggage around, like, actually making lifestyle changes um, so I was like, oh, I'll just take the supplements. I'll try to get more sleep and it'll go away. <laughs> like, um, no, like, that, that didn't is, work. That is no. Um, so I actually had to get put on armor. So thyroid medication, cause my thyroid was so depressed from the adrenal dysfunction. Um, and she was like, you need to stop exercising as much and eat 2000 calories a day. And I literally laughed at her and I was like, that's not happening. <laughs> like I'm not doing that. Cause I was eating around 1400 a day because I, I wanted to lose weight. I had put on weight from like being too intense and my, my, you know, my thyroid was depressed. Right. So, okay. I gained weight. I have to depress my calories more. Right. No, not with the, not with a shitty thyroid. Right. Like it just, it doesn't always work calories in calories out. And it wasn't working that way for so long for me. Um, and it took me a good year, a good year to go from 1400 a day to 1700 a day. Like I had so much shit around eating more and doing less because that's completely against what we've been told. And it scared the shit out of me because I'm like, you know, I'm a petite frame. So I'm like, if I'm going to put on 10 pounds, 15 pounds, 20 pounds, that's going to look huge on me. I'm going to feel terrible. Um, there was a lot of fear there. Um, my health had to be more important to me at that point. You yeah. know, like I had to make that distinction of like, you know, okay, I'm going to be a bloated, overweight personal trainer. Okay. Like I have to accept that for my own health. Um, that was really hard. Um, and like I said, I, I, I had relapsed before from like too much stress, um, on top of eating more and actually doing less. So taking away those stressors, right. That I had control over that were damaging me. Um, whew, I also had to do a lot of self care work, like a lot of deep self care work of, really radical forgiveness. It sucked. <laughs> it was like, like, I had to be face to face with myself. Like, I'm sorry I did this to you. Like I wrote myself a letter of like, dear body, like, I'm sorry I pushed you so much. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't listen when you were tired and I didn't sleep and I restricted you and, you know, forced you to do things you didn't want to do, right? Like if you were talking to another person saying, you know, forcing them and pushing them and restricting them like that would be fucking abuse right yeah we don't see it that way always because culture's like well this is healthy 
No, yeah. like your intention matters so much. And my intention was not in the right place. I was, I was doing things out of fear. I was doing things out of control. Um, it wasn't good. So I had to let go of all that. Like I literally had to lean back and just surrender and be like, all right, I'm eating chips and guac. I mean, ice cream. I mean, bread, I mean, popcorn. Like I had to go completely the opposite direction, eating healthy. I wasn't, eat, I wasn't eating fast food or anything. I wasn't eating, you know, a bunch of chemicals and processed stuff because I needed to still support my hormonal function and my endocrine system. Right. Um, but I needed that chance to lean back and just trust my body. And that was the hardest thing <laughs> I've ever had to do in my healing process. Yeah. And you mentioned a, a key word in there and I've noticed at least from my, my perspective, that there's a lot of people that want change. But if you've gone down the rabbit hole too long, I think the only thing that can really start the process of change is complete surrender. Oh, it's so hard, Mike. <laughs> it it's is. so hard. It's incredibly hard, especially yeah. when you are a motivated person because yeah. there are a lot of people that, you know, because you're talking about people's deep, our deep rooted beliefs, like to a philosophical mm -hmm. level, like I am resp when you, when you are the kind of person that says I'm responsible for my happiness, I'm taking ownership of my life. These are all good things, right? You want to take ownership of your success and mm -hmm. I'm not going to blame others for my problems and taking, you know, an ownership type of approach to your health or your six, you know, your success in your career. When you've adopted that philosophy, now all of a sudden, when you realize things are not working out really well, surrendering is almost admitting that you are entirely wrong, that you, you're the one that's the problem now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to be the one to get out of the way, and I do need to rely on other people. I can't mm -hmm. listen to myself in this situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that's just the hardest <sighs> bridge for, every, for anyone to cross. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I was so bad. Um, especially like was my, when my cycle came, uh, like when I was menstruating, it got really worse. Like my hormones are just like, like explosions. Right. And I remember like, I was, I was so fatigued. I couldn't even take a shower. Like I was getting winded washing my hair. I couldn't work. Um, it was really, really bad. And I had to depend on my boyfriend at the time for a little bit of like him to go get me groceries and he would cook me food. And I was constantly getting like adrenaline rushes, like constant, you know, like when you're really excited about something, right? They wouldn't yeah. stop. I was so scared. I was like, I feel like I'm dying. And I'd like wow. try to, I try to read books like, um, happy, like comedy books to try to like calm me down. But it, it just, my body was just intense. And you know, now that I'm reflecting on it now, it, it was like screaming at me, like, stop trying to control everything. Like, yeah. trust me, like hear me and then trust me. Um, it's, it's so hard. And I, and I don't think it's emphasized enough of like really recovering and trusting your body. Like it's a huge unraveling for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And getting to, getting to that point sometimes takes rock bottom. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. for a lot of people, you have to hit rock bottom. And sometimes when you think you've hit rock bottom, you really haven't. And it keeps right. getting worse. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think one of the things that stops the process that, you know, you finally got to a point where you've, you've obviously, we'll talk about this here in a few minutes is you've gotten to the point where you're, you're much better now. You've, I don't oh, want to say yeah. recovered, but you are no, much I'm, better off now. You've, you no, definitely hit that pivot point. But I think one of the things that gets, gets in our way and prevents people from doing that is, um, Sometimes when, you're, when your issue is due to too much control, for instance, you are like super low carb, super, uh, super, super healthy, super, mm -hmm. super everything. You yes. know, you're in control of everything. Sometimes the, yes. the control, the, the act of control is the problem. And people mm -hmm. sometimes try to fix their problem with more control they'll go, they'll go vegan or they'll, right, right, they'll, right. they'll go hire another coach, another nutrition coach that's going to give them a new plan. And so you keep, the problem is that you're trying to control so many things that you've, you've pulled yourself down with control rather than releasing yeah. control. And I think part of the fear there is, you know, maybe you did or didn't have this fear is that you've developed this sense of ownership in your life. So to release control, you have a fear of, 
going literally the opposite direction. Well, if I just l- let con- let control go completely, then I'll be going to end up obese. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to be like those people. So you have this association of letting go with becoming unhealthy again. When worrying, incessantly worrying about how healthy you are isn't healthy in itself. And yeah. And that's, that's something I think that we need, you know, as a culture, do a better job of. And so, um, you know, you're a testament to the positive outcomes that can happen when you do let go of this obsessive control. So when you actually got better, what were, what were some of the things that you found that have now become successful habits for you and describe this process of this new discovery for yourself? What successful habits do I still do? Yeah. So, uh, for instance, I know that you picked up you picked up kettlebells and oh, kettlebells um, are great. Yeah. Yeah, and you you've you, I know you've adopted a strength mindset. I know. Yes, so let's yes. talk a little bit about that. And okay, I will get into the empowerment part in a little bit, but let's talk about you know training wise, you know, in the more literal senses. What have you picked up now? Well, honestly, the first thing that comes to mind <laughs> is that I eat ice cream for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <boy. That> was, <laughs> I know you as a nutritionist might not want to hear that. Um, I eat, so I eat like, um, like a dairy free ice cream, right? Um, which, you know, there's not a bunch of preservatives and stuff in it, but that's so like a coconut milk ice cream or like something? a coconut milk, ice cream, cashew milk, almond milk. Um, like a, I try to get the lower sugar one just because sugar is inflammatory. Um, yeah. So still as healthy as I can, but like that small thing of giving myself permission to wake up and be like, I want to eat ice cream for breakfast and like doing that and not eating the whole pint, but just like, oh my God, it's the most liberating thing because I have food freedom now and I exercise that very frequently. So like I can have a pint of ice cream in the freezer now, I can have multiple pints and if I go eat ice cream, I'm going to eat a serving. I know a serving is a fourth of that container, right? And there's no like... um, anxiety around it there's no guilt and there's no there's no anxiousness around it like I want to eat the whole thing right yeah yeah. that has been incredible of like really leaning into that and and giving myself a ton of food flexibility and trusting my body and trusting myself that I'm not going to overeat um so I I that's been really powerful. Just like I said, I had to allow myself to eat chips and guac and bread and things that I didn't allow myself to eat for years and restricted and kind of put labels on them as bad. Um, that was huge, huge, huge to like screw all that stuff. And I still eat paleo ish like 80, 90% of the time. Right. Because that's who I am as a person and my values. So anyway, that was huge of really trusting myself and putting myself in the positions where I had to. And um, I, I want to touch on something there too. I'm really glad you said this because, you know, like you would think as a nutrition coach, I, and there might be somebody listening thinking like my hand's right on the abort button, like it's <laughs> talking about eating ice cream. And I'm really glad you mentioned it too, because one thing I really fight with people is this association with good and bad food. I'm really mm-hmm. happy that you found a zone. Now I think it's really odd that you found a zone eating ice cream in the morning, but <laughs> you're what the, a good our definition of good and bad are habits that have a positive outcome. Mm. That's what good and bad is. Love you know, that. There's no, there's no, you know, an Oreo isn't bad or good, but if you yeah. have type two diabetes and you want to reverse your type two diabetes, that food is not going to help you do that. There's no good or I bad. It's that. just not going to help you. It will do damage. And so, you know, for somebody who needs to lose control, you know, obsessive control, Mm-hmm. maybe giving yourself permission to do these things is exactly what you need. So I had, it was, this is independent basis here, but somebody listening needed to hear that. Somebody yeah. absolutely needed to hear that because you are actually better off now than you were before. It just so happens you're eating ice cream for breakfast and that's something you absolutely, you absolutely yeah. needed to do. So I, I, I'm sorry to cut you off there, but I thought that was extraordinarily important that, that we, need to, we need to stop the good and bad food argument thing. Yes. And let's talk about things that help us achieve our goals. And some people absolutely need, I've even seen studies that when you restrict food from teenagers and kids, mm-hmm. that it has the absolutely, absolute reverse effect. It For starts sure. sneaky behaviors, them hiding food, them feeling shameful about themselves when they eat certain things. And that spirals into this whole problem, I think, as adults. So mm-hmm. that's, that's really important that you touched on that. And I think it's fantastic. You found a zone that 
allows you to have the things you want and get rid of the obsessive control via ice cream in the morning. Hell, it works for you. Ice cream in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'll usually have a protein shake with it, like, but the ice cream is usually there. There you um, go. So with the training philosophy too, that helped tremendously. So I wasn't. And again, it wasn't like the training that I was doing was bad. It was the intention in which I was doing it. And I was bringing a lot of my own stuff into it because when I first got into the gym, I was doing Wendler five through one, like a powerlifting program, which was yep. great. Yeah. Um, great, actually, great, training program. great training program. I was married to it for a really long time. Um, and my nurse practitioner, when I, in 2013, she actually said like, continue lifting heavy things. Like don't run, don't do a bunch of cardio, but like lift heavy things just a couple times a week, eat more, sleep more, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so it wasn't the training program, but you know, on Wendler, so like the third set is you can kind of max out, right? You kind of try to hit a PR. Yeah. My PRs were like major PRs every time I was like, go, on, get this last round. And like, yeah. I have like the other dudes in the gym, like yelling at me, go, just get that squat. Like, yeah. I was like, borderline like freaking out in my head you know I was listening to, like heavy m metal music um yes that's not good for adrenal fatigue though like that's good <laughs> in little small doses right right um if you can handle it so I, I just took every training program to the extreme well if this is good then like doing double this should be better right yeah um which a lot of us have that mentality around fitness and when I got introduced to strong first and the kind of the, that whole kettlebell organization and my coach and now my partner um he taught me a whole different philosophy with kettlebell training and that like it's a practice instead of like trying to dominate and uh destroy yourself every workout but just you're doing just enough to get better um and stop focusing so much on the numbers right yeah. like because if you're not focused on the calories then you're going to start focusing, you know, this, there's this whole thing like strength is new skinny, right? But like you could still get crazy and neurotic about your weightlifting numbers and your reps and your sets. Whereas sure. once I developed as a practice and a skill, I was so much more cognizant of like how my body moved and how I felt in my body rather than like trying to chase some external goal. And that was, that was huge. And I, I, I highly recommend doing a movement practice that way. It feels so much more functional and freeing for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, totally agree. Working on adopting a process oriented mindset mm -hmm. changes everything. It's changed everything for me as well. Um, because it's, you, you have a lot less self punishment type of yes. thinking. Um, you know, if you don't hit your numbers then your day could be ruined, but mm -hmm. you know, after a while, you know, like I, this may be different for everybody, but for me, as a 36-year-old father of two, you know, if I walk out of the gym upset that I didn't hit a, a, a PR back squat that day, uh, what am I doing? Like, it's right. not, not, even, not even close to, like, a priority in my life. Like, it's nice. Right. It's nice it's to fun. get stronger, but... You know, I was talking to one of my one of my coworkers, Emily Kiernan, who's a fantastic trainer, and she's got a lot going on in her life, and she has this this you know this whole, huge backstory to things that have been happening to her and her husband in the last year that are just nuts. And we've talked about a little bit of the self punishment, um, or I'd say negative self talk that trainers can go through, especially us. You know, if you get into the thirties and twenty twenty five and forty year old trainers you're not the 25 year old trainer who can, who's just out of college, a D one athlete who can wow all of the prospects in the gym and they all want to mm -hmm. sign up with them because they're super energetic. And, you know, maybe, you know, particularly with Emily, I know she said something that she can deadlift. I forgot what her deadlift was, but it was, I think close to 235, 245. And she's like, well, yeah, but my deadlift was that much two years ago. It should be much higher. Mm. But I think there's still a value, especially if you can look at your life and have reasonable expectations with everything that's going on, whether you're a coach or you're, uh, you know, somebody who's just going to a gym right now. There's a value, if you just think of the quality of life in general, to maintaining a 245 pound deadlift from 30 years old all the way to 40 years old. You could say, you know, oh, crap, my deadlift's hasn't gone up a little bit but you can also say shit this thing hasn't gone down at all either i am yeah maintaining a level of strength and habit throughout my life and i'm actually enjoying the process in the meantime rather than being you know the kind of person who works your ass off in the gym and then you're too tired to do anything when you're at home 
yeah, I felt like I was getting hit by a truck every time I went to the gym. And I was like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to feel like. I mean, yeah. it's getting better. First, yeah, I was, I think another thing is like people will push through pain a lot. And they think like no pain, no gain kind of deal. Because I push through chronic back pain. I've had chronic back pain since like 18 or 19. And uh, that's dumb. Don't do that because it just gets worse, right? And we just, because we can get so obsessive over like what success looks like. Versus like you said, just switching the script a little bit of like, hey, you maintained this for like 10 years. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you didn't get much stronger, but like what else did you accomplish? And what other things did you really value? Right? Like, I'm, and I'm, maybe I'm not as strong. I'm not squatting, you know, my body weight or what was it? I think I was squatting like one and a half times my body weight. I was doing like 13 reps of chin ups. Um, that just, I don't know, like that doesn't light me up as much. It's not something I want to chase. Which is, yeah. which is fine if one day that changes, but you just, you got to be really true to your own priorities, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And look, well, let me ask you, what are you chasing now? <laughs> I don't know if I can go into all the details on that one. Um, what am I chasing now? I'm chasing more, um, well, my word for this year is open. Like I'm chasing more openness and more exploration and more just like alignment Right. And like yeah. doing really heavy work right now doesn't feel, doesn't feel like me right now. I've been doing a lot more dancing and, uh, flow movement and like that feels good. I'm going by like, what feels good in my body? Am I doing this out of fear or protection or am I doing this because this is something that really contributes to me in a way that feels meaningful. So I'm constantly asking myself that. And right now, like, yeah, prioritizing like good, feel good movement, feeling really, good in my body and open that's a priority yeah and what's it like being being a female in you know a, a male dominated industry for the most part and dealing with body image and you know I'm sure there's a struggle in there too you mentioned early on in your story you know you're eating four, 1400 calories a day working your tail off no doubt some of that had to do with wanting to look a specific way and mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure there was an, an internal struggle that you've gone through. And, I'm, I, you know, there's no real one answer, but, this, but like, what's some of the perspective you've developed over time on, you know, your own body, your own body image, female strength, and, you know, this whole culture that we have right now of females who are kind of working out and eating as a way to spite their body. It's kind of an ugly picture. What, how are you... What have you developed there in your mind? You asked some really loaded questions. <laughs> I am I, I am a loaded question guy. So, um, I'll, I'll tell you what. Let's go layer by layer here. What were some of the struggles that you went through, and then what's your thought process now as far as body image goes? Okay, so my body image. I never like thought I was fat or anything. I just had a fear of becoming fat. Um, and honestly, I don't know if it was a thing about men. It was really more of a control thing for me, feeling like I didn't have control over my body. Um, again, I'm just kind of processing this as I think about it now, but I feel like um, I've written about this before several times, but like my body often didn't feel like mine. Like I didn't have control over my space because I would give my power away. Um, and I would let men kind of come into my field and make me feel like this was not home anymore. Like just really icky feelings. Um, sometimes emotionally and also just physically, like they just didn't make me feel good. Um, and I think for me, like controlling the food and the movement and becoming like strong was a way of armoring. Right. So I don't feel like it necessarily was like to grab male attention. Like I was, I was good on that. Um, I had a boyfriend at the time. I wasn't like pursuing men. Um, yeah, it was more of just a, a, a control thing and an ownership of my, of my body. Um, actually the guys at the gym, they would tell me, uh, that I should put on weight. Like they thought that I was getting too skinny and I was, um, and they were like, they were like, eat a freaking banana, Jess. And I was like, no, no, carbs. And they're like, you're stupid. <laughs> like they would, they would consistently tell me, uh, you know, when Dixie's across the street, like we get a freaking banana. Oh no, no, I'm going to go eat a steak. You know, like I was training really heavy and hard and they were trying to look out for me. Um, so 
yeah, it wasn't it wasn't really for for that. Um, my body image got better the more I stopped thinking about my body. <laughs> <laughs> like the more I just um, enjoyed it. Like the more I just appreciated it for uh, what it could do. Right? You hear that pretty cliche, um, yeah. but it, but it's true. Like I would I really just improved my um, safety in my body, which really helped. Um, and I just prioritized other things outside of my body. Like I started really developing the business and who I was as a person and, and worked on things outside of just my physical appearance. Um, I still think it's important. I had this conversation the other day with my partner of like, our bodies are an asset to us, you know? Um, yeah. The way that we dress, for example, commands a different way about us. People approach us different. Um, so I do think, like, I do value my physical appearance. I think it is an asset in my life. Um, but there's a there's a fine line there, right? And it's like, who am I really doing this for? What am I really doing this for? Is this really productive? Yeah. Is, is this fear-driven? <laughs> right? Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it did. Absolutely. Because, um, you know, Jason Sai was a guest on the podcast, I think, episode 14, and he specializes in, you know, fat loss and body image. And he's made that very same point before that, you know, if you want to fix someone's body image, you don't try and, you know, try to, try to recreate a new way to think about your body. And you don't try more ways to make a positive body image. You just, let's just stop thinking about your body. Like, right. let's just stop thinking about that for right now. Let's focus completely elsewhere because it's kind of like the whole don't think of a pink elephant thing. Like your first thing, a pink egg elephant. You can't <laughs> stop it. So yeah. when you say stop thinking about your body, girls, or you think, you know, think about your body this way instead, you're still thinking about your body. You're still, you're still driving the behavior as body, body image driven. So I think it's very interesting. You said that that was something that was very successful for you. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, as far as the empowerment of strength, I know I'm, I'm asking you some of these questions because I know I've, I've already read some really good material. And I don't know if you just like black out and go into a, a dark place to go write. And then yes, I you, know, do. And, and, you, know, you, you write some pretty profound stuff. And I know the probably the most profound stuff that I've written before. It's hard for me to remember what I wrote because, you know, I was in a I was in a very quiet space and really on point, you know, when I was writing it. And so you know, I know you've already written a lot of really good stuff on this, so I like your perspective on it. I want you to share with the listeners maybe some of the, the philosophy you've built on, like, feminism, like females becoming empowered through strength. What are some positive ways to think about strength and um, maybe some negative ways that women use strength and this whole, like, female empowerment idea? So loaded. So loaded. So loaded. <laughs> but you're the, person, you're the person for this. Thank you. I appreciate that because I've done a lot. Of, I've done a lot of work here, and it's hard to admit like I was doing that wrong. I wasn't thinking straight on that one, right? So I literally just relaunched like my whole business name. I was under the FemPro, uh, Fem for uh, Feminist, and Pro for Prowess or Distinguished brow, uh, Bravery or Courage, and I loved the FemPro. Like, I really spent a lot of freaking time and energy into it because I wanted to bring women up. Um, and I and I had success with it. Like, I, I, I made money off it. I did group programs. I did one-on-one -on -one with it. Um, I did a membership program. But it started to get really out of alignment with me. Um, <laughs> one thing in particular happened... Um, the beginning of last year, I kind of set this intention that I was like, I want to bring a male into my practice. And it's not like I didn't have any men in my practice, but very, very little, or they would be for a short period of time, right? And I just like set this intention. I was like, I want to bring a man into my practice that makes me feel really respected, because that wasn't always my experience. And so weird, this like random man I've never met found my email from like five years ago from a business card in Colorado, like four years ago or five years ago. And just randomly messaged me. He's like, you training? And I was like, yeah. Whoa. And I've been working with him for over a year now. And he was like a catalyst. He actually just emailed me before I got on this call too and congratulated me on the new name change. Weird. Oh. Um, he was actually a huge catalyst. If he's watching this, he's going he's gonna to feel all good. Um, <laughs> he was a huge catalyst in having me make the shift because he, he was a young male. He's like your, your age. 
Um, and he really respected me and really respected me as a coach. And it made me feel like, wow, what have I been doing? Like I, I completely like isolated men. And I realized there was a lot of fear that I had around working with men in my practice. Right. And what I noticed was like, that was also coming out in the way that I trained. I was coming out in my interactions, right? So how we behave in one place is often how we behave everywhere else, right? Yeah. yeah. So it was really telling when I noticed that, that, that um, I didn't have safety with men in my professional field. Um, and, I, and I noticed like when I, when I would be lifting, there was a lot of armoring going on that, again, like it wasn't, I didn't do this for male attention. It was more of like a protective kind of thing. Um, like, man, when I got up to that barbell, it was like this rage. It was like this don't fucking touch me energy, you know? Like, I would just channel. And it was like, I didn't realize it was bad. Like, I didn't realize it was bad. Um, and I still have rage in me, but I don't try to put it where it's not warranted, right? Like, I try to move through it, um, but I try not to isolate people who shouldn't be isolated because of it. So that makes sense. Like I'm taking responsibility yeah. for my rage. Um, um, and, and it takes a lot of awareness to do that. And I think a lot of women um, out there do do that. You know, they've been assaulted or harassed or whatever. And they just feel like, well, I'm just going to get big and strong. Right. Like I'm going to, I'm going to just dominate my area. I have to said like, I would piss all over my territory in that barbell. Like, yeah. That was my domain. You don't touch me. You don't go near me. It was toxic. It was like really damaging. Wow. Do you feel like it kind of perpetuated that even more? Yeah, it was bad. It, it completely like perpetuated this belief that I was unsafe. That's why I wrote in that post I think of. Um, it perpetuated the belief that I was fundamentally like always unsafe in my body and I had to be guarded and I had to put up this armor and I had to be quote unquote strong in order to protect myself. And that wasn't, that wasn't the case. Like I realized that's not the reality that I want to live in. Like that's not, that's not what, what I want to see. It's not what I want to think. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where did that take you? Like where, where have you gone now with that line of thinking? What motivates you to get strong and how do you talk to some of your women as you're, you know, you're going through a rebranding process now, but some of the women in FemPro uh, program and, you know, your future programs, how do you talk to them? What do you encourage them to explore in themselves? So I'm actually doing a talk on this. I got asked to go to the Virginia mountains at a, at a woman's retreat and I'm actually doing a big talk on this. Wow. I'm nervous. Good for you. <laughs> This is like, I think the third time I've had this talk. Um, but essentially what I'm, what I'm going over is as um, building awareness around it first of, of being aware of like how we're being guarded or how we're disembodying. Um, it's kind of a protective mechanism of when we're really freaked out, we want to leave our body. Like we're really feeling unsafe and we want to like physically leave. I would do that in my training. Like it would be so hard and I would just like, everything would feel heavy that I would, I would like check out, right? Um, like doing those sort of things isn't going to help. Um, verse, I learned, this is kind of like abstract. So it's kind of hard to explain. So I just had to learn how to do it. Um, mm -hmm. But instead, and this is why the practice mindset helped, is like when I was doing a lift, instead of trying to escape the discomfort, I would get even more grounded. Like I would really like physically feel the ground under my feet. Sometimes I would close my eyes. I would be so intentional of what I was feeling and just like sit into the discomfort. Right. And like yeah. stand my ground. I, I can't really explain it. It's like a, it's like a mental, like it's just something you have to practice. So I wish I could explain it more. Well, more so sounds like what you, what you're saying is if I'm translating this right, is that you really focus on the moment itself. Yes. It's very present. Yeah. Rather than um, anything outside that might be bothering you or anything outside that's kind of, you're trying to, you're filtering in as motivation instead, let go of that and just feel the moment for what it is. Yeah. And I wasn't involved in the stories either in my head. That was another thing of like, I have to dominate, right. Or like I have to control but there was, there was none of that kind of script running in my head. It was just like, I'm here to be present and I'm here to be strong and I'm here to stay grounded. 
I'm here, I'm here to execute, I'm here to lift this weight or whatever, but there wasn't that same level of hmm, aggression. Yeah. You know, I, you, I guess that's ringing some bells in my mind because I've talked to a person who worked in a, um, in a facility where they would, um, I think uh, there were psychologists, I think from the psychological end of things, they would counsel women who had eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And one of the activities that they would do with them is show them pictures of supermodels or people that would be culturally thought of as beautiful. And they were asked to describe the photo objectively, meaning they can't say she's pretty or they can't say she has beautiful hair. They have to say she has long hair, mm. she has blonde hair, she has one freckle on her nose. And think of things objectively rather than turning it into an emotional experience that mm. they had attached a, a, a judgment or a critique on, but rather just literally what was in the photo, just describe it. And they had to practice it over and over. That behavior and that thought had to be practiced to think of things for what they were, not just their um, interpretation of it. Yes. And yeah, so, so it's smaller. Yeah, it so, sounds like something that you're practicing there. It's just creating more of an objective view of what you're doing. And, uh, you know, I, I'm particularly fascinated with the whole idea of female empowerment, because I know one thing that I thought was fantastic with, with CrossFit, one thing that CrossFit specifically did that I can definitely give them credit for was they were through the CrossFit games and some of the media exposure, they were able to recreate a thought of strength in women. Like what women are capable of, like you saw women in the CrossFit games that were, you know, clean and jerking weight that the average woman never even thought about even trying. But these were average women prior to trying CrossFit for the most part. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's changed a little bit. It's much, much larger of a sport. But, you know, I never even thought as I was watching this, all of the angles that you've talked about is why women are trying to get strong mm. also matters. Why you're doing what you're doing matters. And are you using it as a defense mechanism or a way to prove yourself to all of the rest of the world that you can do you know, something, are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing it for others? Are you perpetuating this comparison issue that we seem to have? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd, I'd never really thought about that until I started reading your writing. And that's why I think it was particularly, particularly interesting. So how do you go about coaching nowadays? What are you doing? What's the rebranding process like? And who are you trying to coach and counsel and, you know, offer some of your amazing wisdom to? Thank you. Um, the rebranding process was a pain in my ass. <laughs> when you were saying that, I was like, yep, that was like three days um, of just like doing all the things. I could have hired somebody, but you know, when you have a specific way you want something and you know how to do it, sometimes it's, sometimes it's hard to outsource. Um, so I, I just hustled um, and rebranded everything because I, I wanted it to reflect more the people that I've actually been working with who are people who feel broken. Like that's, they, they kind of just feel like their bodies beat up they're sore um and they want to they want to feel their strength again so it's kind of what we're talking about right of like for me as a woman like i didn't feel safe in my body my body felt like a threat to, to me and it still does man it still feels like a threat to me sometimes let me tell you and i'm working through that shit daily um yeah but it's it's just it's just you know, I'm keep, I keep going through the mud, as somebody said the other day. I keep going through the mud. Um, but it, it's that same sort of thing. So it's like, like if, you, if you feel broken, if you feel like your body is dangerous, a threat, if you feel like your body is an inconvenience, like I work with those people to help them find their strength and find grounding and find gratitude in their bodies and their movement, right? To circle around to where we started of like, your body is a beautiful thing. Everybody is a beautiful thing. Like there's, there's every patient that I worked with, every, every, body that I worked with like had potential right like yeah. they had potential to do something there there has been no body that has been completely broken that I couldn't help right yeah um, so those are the people that I work with um, primarily with like the kettlebells it's freaking crazy how much strength heals like I often use that hashtag of strength heals like 
I say, I don't always know how it works. Um, cause I'll do like therapy exercise with them for a couple weeks. And then I'm like, all right, like you're moving pretty well. Let's load this. And we load a pattern and it's like their symptoms start going away very rapidly. It's don't know. Pretty amazing. It really is. I see that. I see that with people too, just getting somebody into a position where they can become stronger. A lot of other things seem to get better along with it. So yeah. as you've, as you've seen some success with this and I, I know what you're probably thinking when I say you've become successful in it. I know everyone that I say, you know, I've, I I say you're successful. I usually get corrected and say, you know, like, well, I'm not successful yet. I'm a work in progress. And so I want to make sure that people understand when I say somebody's successful, or I'm sure you think of yourself this way is that it's all that means is that you've seen progress Mm -hmm. coming out of, of a whole, we're all work in progress. I mentioned that I had some adrenal problems before and, uh, you know, having a family and being a coach at the same time, like I still get in periods where, you know, like it's hard to get out of bed. You're just so tired yeah. because, you know, if you're, if you're not constantly checking these boxes or not constantly aware of your issues, they can come back and then you have to keep working on them. It's like life is never, life is never done. It's a process. But yeah. now that you've become successful in this and you've seen some consistent progress for yourself, I'm a big believer in boundaries. Okay. There are some, yeah, there are some issues. Um, when you know yourself, there are some things that I think as you get wiser and older and a little more mature, you decide to develop some non-negotiables in your life. And these are things that are set far be far in front of the danger zone to make sure you never even get there. So yeah. I have mine. What are yours? Have you developed, maybe you haven't thought about them before, but what are some things that you've developed in your life that are non-negotiables to make sure that you stay on the rails to a degree? Um, sleep for sure. I am, <laughs> my boyfriend always says I'm a sleep diva. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. I will take that. Do you hear that lawnmower, by the way? It, it, uh, barely. It's kind of like faint. There's not even a yard over there, and I hear him over there. Because um, <laughs> everybody is mowing lawns somewhere in Florida. Um, yeah, always. So, yeah, sleep. Like, I'm definitely a sleep diva. Um, I actually when we moved in together, I was like, I need my own bedroom. Like that's non-negotiable. I need like my own place to sleep. (laughs) Um, I need my space. That's also huge. By a house. Um, I'm going to have a little she shed in the backyard. We're like, that's my place. (laughs) She shed. I also want to call it a pleasure cave. Um, So my she shed pleasure cave out in the backyard where like, that's my space. And like, if I need to go in my space, nobody comes in my space. Right. Like that's right. We all need a place to like process and not have input all the time, right? Like we're right. so is so much input, and then I could you know coach clients in there if I wanted to or whatever I wanted to do in that space. Um, non-negotiable space, sleep, um, and being respected. I really can't tolerate people who are disrespectful. Um, yeah, that just that just sucks. Like don't don't disrespect me, <laughs> you know. So you're quick to cut those cut those relationships or conversations off. Yeah. And it bothers me about like when I see, especially my friends who are getting stepped all over, because they're being disrespected. Um, and it's oftentimes because they're not setting their boundaries and I have to, I have to pull back a little so I don't like jump on them and be like, what are you doing? Like tell them that they're being a shithead to you. Like set your boundaries, but it's hard. I act like, you know, I, I'm very quick to do it, which for the most part I am, but, um, it can be challenging. Very challenging. But I, yeah, like you have to have enough self-respect for yourself in order to not take that behavior from somebody else, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, taking the the boundaries a step further or, you know, thinking about lifestyle habits, um, do you have any like morning rituals or nighttime rituals? Like something you do every single time. It's fine if you don't. Like I get all kinds of answers, but I ask every single guest this. Do you have any morning or nighttime rituals that you do every single night? I'm really bad about morning rituals. Ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wake up and I, I don't know, I think about brushing my hair. I usually brush my hair at least. And I'll put on makeup even if I don't see anybody. Like I guess that's part of my routine of like I don't want to look like I just rolled out of bed all day. Um, I like to look presentable for myself even if I'm still in underwear. It's very courteous um, of you, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's basically my morning routine because it's so much flows. Like 
sometimes I want to lay in bed and write for an hour. Sometimes, you know, I want to get up and do all the work at first. Um, and then in the evening, since it's colder out now, my dog is so cute. Like when he comes in from going pee, he likes to be tucked in. So he knows he like waits I'm like, all right, go when I get his blanket. And like I tuck him in and he's just like, he's just like this fat mastiff lab dog and he loves to be like snuggled. So that's been, that's been enjoyable. I get to tuck my little dog in. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, well, I, that's kind of all I have for you today. I mean, do you have anything, any, I don't know, last words that you want to give anyone, any moment, little quips of wisdom? What's your, what's your email address? We'll start there. How can people get a hold of you? Rehabited coaching at Gmail. That okay. sounds good. So, yeah, <laughs> I just if anybody... made it a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> Rehabited coaching at Gmail. Okay. Rehab it. And I can put that in the show notes. Um, yeah. So if anybody wants to follow up with you, they can. Um, now that I've delayed a little bit, do you have a quip of wisdom or any kind of lasting advice? Don't be an asshole to your body. Don't be an asshole to your body. Like your body. One of my like principles that I go by is, um, body rules. Like, body rules like it's going to tell you it's going to give you symptoms right like we can push all we want we can logically rationalize oh like fasting and this and this and this and if i have all my things in a row like no man like body rules body's going to tell you no i don't like this and you're going to have to listen at some point whether that's rock bottom like hopefully not but don't be an asshole to your body because it'll it'll tell you and it'll suck to get out of it yeah be good body to yourself. rules man body, body rules, rules. All right, cool. Well, this has been an absolutely fantastic show. I can't thank you enough for coming on. I'm super excited about the show and I can't wait to hear the feedback on it. Um, so please email Jess if you have any follow-up questions. If you're in the Orlando area, please come and see her um, and let her become your coach. She's, she's not going to let you down. She's absolutely fantastic. So um, this has been the Inward Investing Podcast. I'm Mike Ritter signing off for Todd Whalen and uh, we'll see you all next week.